turn with me to the book of First Samuel. We have little, we've got guest Bibles in the back if you'd like, and you can follow along on the screen. First Samuel, the book of First Samuel, chapter one. It's definitely before Revelation, so you'll get the whole thing. First Samuel chapter one, we're going to begin our reading at verse number one. The Bible says, Now there was a certain man of Rephimian Zophim of the Mount of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Joram, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zip and an Ephronite. And he had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Paniah. And Paniah had children, but Hannah had no children. And this man went up out of the city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Paniah his wife and to all her sons and her daughters portion. But uh, unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had shut up her womb. And her adversary also provoked her sore for to make her fret, because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, she so she provoked her, therefore she wept and did not eat. Then said Elkanah, her husband, to her, Hannah, why weepest thou, and why eatest thou not, and why is thy heart grieved? Am I not better to thee than ten sons? So Hannah rose up after that they had eaten in Shiloh, and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat in the seat by the post of the temple of the Lord, and he was in bitterness of soul, and he prayed unto the Lord, and he wept sore. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me, and not forbet, forget pardon me, thy handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then will I give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. And it came to pass, as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli marked her mouth. Now Hannah, she spake in her heart only, her lips moved, but her voice was not heard, and therefore Eli thought she had been drunken. And Eli said unto her, How long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. And Hannah answered and said, No, my lord, I'm a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not thine handmaid for a daughter of Belial, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoke, spoken hitherto. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thy petition that thou hast asked of him. Turn to the book of Judges. Go backwards to the book of Judges, chapter 16. Judges, chapter 16, in verse number 1. Verse 1 says, then went Samson to Gaza, and he saw there an harlot, and he went in unto her. Let's go forward to verse number four. Verse four said, And it came to pass afterward that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and said unto her, Entice him and see wherein his great strength lieth, and by what means we may prevail against him, that we may bind him to afflict him, and we shall give every one of us 1,100 pieces of silver. And Delilah said to Samson, Tell me, I pray thee, where in thy great strength lie, and, and wherewith thou mightest be bound to afflict thee. Go down to verse 11. And he said unto her, If they bind me fast with new ropes that never were occupied, then shall I be weak as other men. Verse number 13. And Delilah said unto Samson, Hitherto thou hast mocked me and told me lies. Tell me wherewith that thou mightest be bound. And he said unto her, If thou weavest the seven locks of my head uh, with the web. Verse 15. 
And she said unto him, How canst thou say, I love thee, when th in thy heart is not with me? Thou hast mocked me these three times, and hast not told me when thy great strength lieth. And it came to pass, when she pressed him daily with her words, and urged him, so that his soul was vexed unto death, that he told her all his heart, and said unto her, There hath not come a razor upon mine head, for I have been a Nazarite unto God from my mother's womb. If I be shaven, then my strength will go from me, and I shall become weak and shall be like any other man. And when Delilah saw that he told her all of his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up this once, for he hath showed me all of his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and brought money in their hand. Jesus, we love you and thank you today for your hand upon us. God, I ask you to open our hearts and our minds today. Let our ears hear what the Spirit says to the church. Help our minds and our hearts, God, to receive what it is that you have for us. We are quick to give you all the praise, all the glory in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. <coughs> you may be seated. This afternoon for the next while, I want to preach to you a message that's good to the new person, to the person who's been in church for a few years, and to the person who's quite seasoned and has been in church for a number of years. I want to preach to you a message titled, <coughs> When Tears Are Not Enough. When Tears Are Not Enough. In the book of 1 Samuel, we find where Samuel, the Hebrew prophet, records the story of a woman named Hannah. Hannah was a woman like any other who desired to bear for her husband a, a child, <coughs> but she could not. Why couldn't she? Why? Because the Bible says that the Lord had shut up her womb because she was barren. And the book of uh, 1 Samuel chapter 1 brings us to the Hannah, in bitterness of spirit, because of her barren womb, wept, and she sought the Lord in prayer. And over time, it was Hannah who both began to realize and understand that her prayers and her desire for a child not being answered is that which would call from her more than just a simple prayer and the shedding of a few tears. If Hannah was to gain God's favor, by her being the one to enter into that place of God's miraculous. What I'm saying to you this afternoon is Hannah knew that her tears were not enough. Hannah needed to go beyond the point of her just shedding some tears. Instead, it was Hannah who needed to get to the place where nothing short of a burning desire inside of her soul superseded all others. Simply said, Hannah had to get down to business with God, and in reading the story of Hannah, that's exactly what we find Hannah had done. She fasted, she prayed, she wept, and Hannah sought the Lord until even audible words could no longer be heard that would have left her mouth. Now, why? Why? Because Hannah was desperate in her desire to obtain, to obtain pardon me, God's favor in her granting her prayer and the petition before him to be able to bear a child. And in Hannah's mind, nothing short of this would, settle, would she settle for. She wasn't willing to get a second uh, opportunity or, or maybe, you know, like the secondary prize. No, she wanted a child, and she wanted a child for a long time. Pardon me. She wanted a child, and she was mocked and made fun of by the others who did bear children. And so she got desperate. Sometimes in our walking with God, I want you to know that we have got to get to the place where we get desperate. So having said this to you, I want you to know it concerns to your life, your walk with God, that there comes a time and maybe there will come a time in your Christian walk where it is you who in an earnest need will be the one to seek the will or even the favor of God. And shall I say that in such a time, it's maybe you who must realize that in seeking for what you desire from God, that there can come a time when your tears are not always going to be enough. Sometimes you've got to get that inner soul where nothing's satisfied, nothing takes the place of what you want, 
there's nothing in your heart that could set aside anything. You have a purpose. You are driven, and you are purposed in a desire to hear from God. So am I saying to you that if you come before God broken and in tears that God won't hear you? No. I'm not saying that, but I submit to you this afternoon that is the fact that in your life at times it's you who too needs to understand that there will come times when your desire or what it is that you feel that you need in your life or what you're seeking God for very well may call for you to go beyond just your crying and just your shedding a tear or two and in your heart wishing that your answer would come. In other words, you'll find that God at times is looking for you to be the one to seek him more earnestly, that just a wish and a promise and kind of a prayer is not going to do it. Now, why, ladies and gentlemen? Because the reason, because there are those times when you will find God looking for you to be the one to seek him for what you want with all of your heart, declaring within your heart and mind, I mean it. I am desperate. I want the Holy Ghost. I need this healing. I have a backslid husband, wife. I have a backslid child, and I'm not willing to set aside for anything else. I mean it, God. I'm not just praying and crying today. I'm not feeling sorry for myself. What I'm telling you today that I understand that time comes when tears are not enough, when I have to push that button on the inside of my heart that says nothing is going to stop me, nothing is going to hold me back. I'm going to get your attention because in my life and in my soul, I mean it. Since I believe that there's too many times when we seek the mercy and the favor of God in a moment, and if you would be honest with yourself, you would be able to say how that there have come those times where more often than not, more often than some would like to admit, where while you were under the influence of the Spirit of God, that it has been you who uttered a promise, where it was you who sought God's favor. You even petitioned God for things in your, <laughs> pardon me, in your life. <coughs> you wanted God to do something for you, to supply it, to answer, to only, in the fleet of a moment, in the utterance of a breath, being now in possession of what you sought God for, to soon forget the matter of urgency that you expressed in your prayer, as well as the desire that you felt, and even in view of the indebtedness that you knew that you owed to God in exchange for what you received. I I'll do this, and I I'll live better, and I I'll pray harder, and, and I'll be more faithful. God, I'll do it, and, and, and I mean it. And then God answers that prayer, like I said, and and off you go in a couple of moments, maybe a few days later, and you forget it. It's a matter of days, weeks, maybe months. What do you do? You begin to take for granted what it was that God in his mercy had bestowed upon you. You begin to forget the vow that you made, the promise that you uttered during your petition before God. And, and God in his love and mercy said, here, I'll give it to you. And, and you're going to do this for me. You'll be faithful. And, and you'll put yourself in a position where I become first in your life. And over time, you just let it go. See, what it is that I'm saying to you today is this. If whatever it is that you desire in your life always would come to you is just as easy as shedding a tear. You know, your gratitude, your expression of thankfulness unto God likely would sooner or later be what would reflect the saying, yeah, so what, I got it, big deal. Yeah, he gave it to me. I think that's why sometimes God holds back on filling people with the Holy Ghost. It's a gift. It's his promise. But if he just gives it to you, maybe he just hands it to you on a platter. It wouldn't take long for you to begin to just throw it aside as not being much. And so for this reason, that's why I believe that there come those times in your life where it's God who lets you know how that in your desire to receive an answer from him, that your tears are not going to be enough. I cried, I, I boo-hooed, and I came to the altar, and then I walked out and did exactly the same thing I've been doing for years. And I came back to church, and I, and I cried, and I petitioned God, and, and God hasn't heard me. He seems like he's turned a deaf ear, and he's not listening to me. Maybe you get to the understanding where, you know what, it's just tears. That's all you're doing. You're feeling sorry, maybe on the inside. But there needs to come that desire that says, you know, the next time I come to church, I'm going to pray until I'm going to press forward. I'm going to do what i got to do to get God's attention. 
in concerns to your walking with God, it is God who's going to be the one who looks for a commitment. Uh Uh-oh, I just said a bad word. He looks for a commitment, a price, or more of a level of a spirit of gratitude from you before God answers your prayer. How much do you want it? How bad do you want it? What do you mean if I do give it to you? Let's turn to the book of Joel, Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2 and verse number 12. Listen to this. Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning. And the first part of verse 13 tells us, and rend your heart and not your garments and turn unto the Lord your God. Get serious with me. Do what I'm asking you to do. Let's go to a very familiar portion of Scripture. It's First Chronicles chapter 7. First Chronicles chapter 7. Verse number 14. Here we go. Oh, Second Chronicles, sorry. Yeah, Second Chronicles 7. Second Chronicles 7, 14. If my people, if my people, were God's people, were his children, he called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. That's called desperation. That's called purpose. I mean this, God. Okay, fine. I've been playing the game. I've been walking the fence and I'm willing to get off that fence and get down to business being serious. Listen to this. And Hannah's desire to bear a child She, Hannah, sought God until (coughs) God brought Hannah to where his, God's unmerited favor was found. In other words, Hannah went beyond just shedding a tear to where she got the attention of God long enough to where God had heard Hannah's cry. She was serious. She was desperate. Could you imagine the Bible talks about praying with the... in a, in a spirit that you, you can't even say words. You don't even, you are just burdened down in your heart. Whatever is holding you in your heart that's binding in the heart that you want to see God do, it is so tough. And there was Hannah before the Lord, and here comes the priest, and he looks at her, watches her mark. The Bible says he marked her mouth, didn't hear any words, and that's why I thought she was drunk. No. No, I'm just dead serious. I want a man child. I want God to hear me. I want God to answer my prayer. And I understand that the only way that's going to come to pass this time and this way is if I am desperate. We say sometimes, the Lord God, I want my healing. I want the Holy Ghost. I need to receive an answer to my earnest prayer. Okay, then, here it comes. How bad do you truly desire what you're seeking for? How bad? Matthew 17 and verse number 21, Matthew chapter 17 and verse number 21. <coughs> Howbeit this kind goeth not out, but by prayer. <coughs> Pardon me, and by fasting. And get in the book of Judges. We read about a man whose name was Samson. Samson was a man blessed by God. Samson was a man whose gift from God empowered him to be with a kind of a supernatural strength. And, and he took a donkey jawbone and he busted a bunch of heads and he took the gates off of the city. He did all kinds of crazy things with his power and the people just knew that Samson, he was blessed of God. He was mighty before God. You know, Samson was a Nazarite, and he bore a Nazarite vow, one which would call for him to never cut his hair. And he was told never to reveal to anyone 
where his strength from God lied. Samson, in possession of his supernatural strength and his youthful rebellion toward his parents, he toyed with them by dating a woman whose name was Delilah. This Delilah was not just any woman, no, she was a Philistine, and it was the Philistines who were the people that were enemies to the God's people. Don't you date a Philistine. You stay away from those people. And he figured, I can do whatever I want. I'm mighty Samson. I got power and strength. And yet, unbeknown to Samson, it was Delilah under the direction of his enemy, the Philistines, who used her to seek to find out just where Samson's strength lied. The reason was because the Philistines sought to destroy Samson. And if they could only catch him in a time without their supernatural power, and so as the story of Samson's life, his life goes, you'll find how in the story it is Samson who did not appreciate what it was that God had given him. And he proved this by his playing with his anointing. And so it was in his lap of his Delilah that Samson finally, after three times of toying with her, and the Philistines came in, tried to take him, and he, and he brushed them off. But he bore his heart this time before her, and he told her where his supernatural strength from God lied. But say this, in a weak moment, Samson broke his vow with God, and he shared with Delilah his secret covenant with God. And once he did tell Delilah the truth, it was Delilah who in turn, she revealed to the Philistines what Samson had told her. In a very short order, you can read how that as a result of Samson doing this, his strength as well as his God-giving anointing was taken away. Turn, please, to the book of Judges, chapter 16, one more time. Judges, chapter 16, and verse number 20. And she said, the Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep, and he said, I'll go out as at other times before, and I'll shake myself, and he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. But the Philistines took him and put his eyes out and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with fetters of brass, and he did grind in the prison house. See, the Philistines took Samson, as we just read, they put out his eyes, they made sport of him. The Bible goes on to say they mocked him, they laughed at him, and no doubt they reminded Samson of what a fool he was for allowing the anointing that God had given to him to be taken away. We think about ourselves sometimes. You know, let's, let's look at our lives today. You've been forgiven. You've, your sins have been washed away in baptism in Jesus' name. God gave you the Holy Ghost. And over time, what happens, we just get sloppy and lazy. And we take our anointing, we take the fact of God's forgiveness sometime for granted. And, you know, we figure, well, guess what? Maybe I'm not sorry this time. And, and, and maybe, maybe it was really nothing. And, and so in your heart, you begin to stray. And in your heart, you begin to forget the fact of the blood that was shed by Jesus Christ upon that cross and, and all that he had done for you and in putting into your soul that Holy Ghost, you begin to take it for granted. I want, you to, I want to tell you this, the Bible doesn't say this, but I can't help to believe that Samson in his place without God, did you catch that? Without God in bitterness and remorse for what he had done, surely he cried out to God and in tears, only to discover that his tears, his tears in the eyes of God were not enough. Losing his anointing, being brought to the place where he was a pawn in the eyes of his enemy. And in due time, it would be nothing shy of the sheer mercy of God that would give Samson revenge on his enemies, but it would not restore him to the place where he was before. I want to touch this one for just a minute. I've uh, been around for a while now, and I've seen a lot of people. You'll find that when you've been in the church for a while and you've been living for God, maybe a year, two years, maybe five years and ten, and then you get lazy, you get sloppy, you get begin to take for granted what you got, and the devil grabs a hold of you maybe, and he pulls you from the church and causes you to do something that maybe you shouldn't have done. And, you know, maybe now your pride, you've got to pull in your pride, you've got to 
tell God your story, you make your way back to the church house, and you, and you figure, I'm going to walk in the door the, the way I came. But as Brother Jerry Jones had said it one day, he, he said, you'll come back, but you won't come back unscarred and unscathed. The devil's going to leave his mark upon your heart. He's always going to stick it in your face and remind you of what you did. And, and you think that I'm going to walk in and everything's going to be rosy and, and clear. But you know what? You crossed that line. You did something you shouldn't have done. And now you're going to feel in your life, I have to keep paying for it, that I can't come back to my original place. Hebrews chapter 6, the book of Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. Very serious for us in the scripture, Hebrews 6, verse number 1, first of all, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. Go down to verse number 4. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of he the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted of the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. See, to sin and to think I'm going to get by with it, it's going to be okay, is to forget that you have an adversary. I've seen many people uh, in their lives, they live for God for a while, and then they, for some foolish reason, they do something silly, and they backslide, let's put it clear. They backslide, they fall away from God, and you know what the problem is? They, they Every day they're hearing this, and, and they look at the people, and as they look at them, and what they did, and how they fell, and, and they don't make their way back, and they can't in their hearts find their way to come back. Why? Because there's a lot of pride and, and a big wall before them, and they've got to realize, well, maybe I, if I cry a couple of times and tell God I'm sorry, but you know, in that kind of a condition of life, tears are not enough. You're going to have to press forward. You're going to have to get to the place where you humble yourself before God and say, God, I didn't mean to do it, and I'm willing to come back hungry. I'm willing to become back faithful. I'm willing to do what it is that you want me to do. And then you purpose in your heart, and you push through. We have a man in our district who had at one time done a very grievous sin, and he fell from God, and he almost lost his wife and his family. And I saw him the day that we were at a camp meeting many years ago, and uh, we were at the altar. It was altar call at the church, and this man walked in in a pair of jeans and a T-shirt and a, and a light jacket, and what did he do? He didn't walk in there and start shaking hands and telling everybody, hey, I'm here today. I hope you're proud of me. No, he made his way right to the altar, and he went over to the side. I'll never forget it. I can see it in my mind today. He went over to the side of the, of the altar. The altar came like this and had steps on the sides, and, and he just got down, and he started to cry, and he started to beg God, and so I got up. I was on in the ministry, so I was sitting on the platform. I got down and went right next to him, and I prayed, and I cried with him, and I, and I went with him, and, and I'm telling him how happy I was to see him back, and, and it was a journey for him to get back into his family. It was a journey for him to get back into his place with God, and, and no, I don't believe that he ever really did retain and get back what it was, but he got back to the place where he was forgiven. He got back to the place where the mercy of God was upon his life. And, and for years now, he doesn't stand there pompous and pious and proud. No, he's humbly thankful. He's grateful that he never lost his wife. He's grateful that his children never turned their back on him. He's grateful for the fact that God met him in the miraculous and that, that spirit of forgiveness came upon his life. So you see, Samson in his current state was made to face the harsh reality of truth that tears for him wouldn't be enough. Could you imagine, just read the story of Samson in its full, in the entirety. What you'll find is he grinded at the mill. He, he is as human as you and I. I can tell you he probably cried and he probably begged God and said how sorry he was that he broke that vow and he did what he did and 
at the end of Samson's life, as you can read, even though the strength of God returned, he said, let me just de- revenge myself of my enemies. God still required in exchange his life. It was Samson who played a game that was for keeps. And truly, in, his, in the end, he lost all of it. He lost everything that he had. God took his life with his enemies. And the Bible says that at Samson's death, more than all of his life, more the enemies were destroyed. I don't want a testimony like that. I don't want to have to live a life where I, I come back as a shred as a, of what I used to be, of what God had made me at one time, and his anointing and his blessing in our life. I want to make sure that I keep my mind sharp and, and myself thankful, and I, and I stand before God and say, I appreciate everything that you have done for me. See, I want you to know there can come a time in your life where you get to the place where your mistakes and your sin can cause you to cross that line of God's mercy. To where it is you who understands exactly what you are doing, which causes God's hand of compassion to be lifted from your life. And what you'll discover is the anointing of God that you had in your life has been lost. See, lured like Samson into the lap of your Delilah, until Satan, your adversary, leads your life to where you get to the place where you're playing with your gift or that secret sin that causes you to turn, has God turn his eyes from your tears. And you wake up to discover in all your bitterness and all of your remorse that your tears are no longer enough. I really got to do something desperate. I got to be a Hannah. I got to be one that's going to just turn my life around in a 180 degree and run as fast as I can and fall before that cross of Christ and beg him for his forgiveness. See, I want you to hear me today. See, God is a merciful God. Don't ever question that. He's long suffering toward us. However, your ignorance in times past that God had overlooked may for you one day run out as it's God who warns us in the book of Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 7. Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 7. The scripture says, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. And the book of Luke, if you'd like to turn there, the book of Luke chapter 10. The book of Luke chapter 10. Beginning our reading at verse number 23. The Bible says, and he turned him unto his disciples and said privately, Blessed are your eyes which see the things that you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see those things which you see and have not seen them, and to hear those things that you hear and have not heard them. I want to tell you, apostolic child of God today, that you are blessed beyond measure. You're walking in the light of truth. You are walking under the shadow of Almighty God. God has given you the Holy Ghost. He's given you an opportunity to one day to rise, to meet him in the air. And I believe what Jesus was saying to his disciples that day was, never allow yourself in your lives to take for granted what it is that you have received. For if you do, the day could surely come when what you received is gone and tears may never be able to bring them back. And so you say to yourself today, wow, well, this is heavy duty. Pastor, why would you preach a message such as this? What is it that God through this message wants us to receive? And I'll say this, too many times in the course of my living for God, I've seen the day arrive in the lives of the blood-bought and the blood-washed saints of God who who cease to seek God beyond shedding just a tear. It's then it's been them who have clearly shown really no regard for the gift nor the gifts that God had they had they have received from God. And over the last now forty one coming on years, I've seen those who come to God and I've seen those who tasted of heavenly things that toy with their gift and even play with their salvation until the day in their lives arrives. When God in his displeasure, he looks down at them and says, your tears are no longer going to be enough. Your sacrifice has been rejected. And in the place of bitterness, I've seen many, as I've already alluded to, walk out the church doors and, and back out to the enemy's territory. And it's Satan who's been waiting to welcome their fallen soul 
back to him. And I've seen many not return, falling down from ministry to saint of God to the new, to the season. They do silly things. They walk away. And, and sadly, in the church today, there remains those among us who take the mercy of God for granted and who play with their anointing as a child of God. And if you're not careful, the day could come in your life when you seek with your tears and God in his displeasure to you says, your tears are not enough. I've got to be serious. This is a game of heaven and hell and life of and death and, and what God gives to us. And, and sometimes, sure, he hands it to you in a platter. Sometimes it's God who, who just bestows upon you and answers your prayer. And you never want to get to the place where you say, oh, big deal, and, and, and who cares, and, and it's not really important anymore. And so I believe that the message from God through me is clear. Every day it's you who needs to not just be but should remain thankful for the gift or the gifts from God that you've received in your life and in your walking with God there should never come a time where you're found pushing the fence to where you in your life play with what and toy with what it is that God gave you toy with that anointing that God in his love and mercy had bestowed upon you and it's you who now takes it just for granted big deal Allowing God to become just commonplace. Commonplace in your life and your thankfulness and the fact that God saved you and that you're filled with the Holy Ghost, etc. No longer holds much weight in your life. That's why when we pray and we worship and we are faithful to God, we've got to give 100%. I don't ever want to lose what God gave me. I don't want to go back out into the world that's going to hell in a hand card. I don't want to be lost. I don't want God to take away from me what he gave me. I don't want to allow that experience to get so cold. That's why it's important that you pray. That's why it's important that you fast. And Brother Holland has, has set up a schedule for, and you don't have to fast and pray for 21 hours. That's a long time, or 21 days, pardon me. That's a long time. I've done that one time, and, and, and that's a very, uh, a, a very hard thing to do. But you know, when you pray, don't just play games and give God a lick and a promise. When you, when you fast and, and, and you're walking with him, just don't give him half of your life. But you know what? Say, God, I'm going to surrender it all. I'm going to give everything I have to you. I'm going to live my heart and, and my life is going to be 100% towards you. Because in your soul's desperation, for whatever reason, you begin to cry to God. You begin to petition for his divine favor. I never want to hear the words, depart from me, work of iniquity, and I never want to hear the words, your tears are no longer enough. Would you stand with me today? I believe that's why I've come to say to you, ladies and gentlemen, saints of God, new and old, no matter where you are in your walk with God, I'm talking to you. And to admonish you to guard your life against you being the one to become complacent. And to protect your heart from ever getting to the place where you no longer cherish what it is that you've received from God. It's like playing roulette with God's gift until the day in your life when you seek to reclaim what you had to only discover your tears that you cry and the remorse that you feel is not enough and what it is that you had maybe is gone I close with this and I want us to pray Romans chapter 11 Romans chapter 11 yeah we do serve a merciful God absolutely we do we serve a long suffering God he puts up with us and our bad behaviors a lot of times and he forgives us as often as we ask him to forgive us but sometimes when God looks down and says, you're just playing the game, you're not serious. You don't really mean it. You're only saying it because you're sorry you got caught. Romans 11 and verse 22. The Bible says, behold, therefore, the goodness and the severity of God. On them which fell severity, but towards thee, goodness. And it doesn't stop there. If thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shall be cut off. I open this altar today and I ask you to come. Would you come and would you pray? And 
And would you just talk to God? God knows where you are in each one of your lives. Don't be scared. We're not going to attack you or bite you. Just come on to the front, ladies and gentlemen. Just make your way to the altar. Get out of your comfort zone and walk forward to the altar. And say, God, you know where I am. 